What does the coronavirus outbreak reveal about the priorities of the Chinese Communist regime? How are U.S. companies in China being impacted? And how does all of this intersect with the Chinese regime's extensive influence operations in the U.S.? This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kellek. In this episode, we'll sit down with political commentator and China analyst Gordon Chang, author of The Coming Collapse of China. You can see him on his Twitter handle at Gordon G. Chang. Gordon Chang, such a pleasure to have you back on American Thought Leaders. Thank you, Jan. So, of course, you know, big topic of the day is coronavirus. And uh, actually, there's been a lot of, I guess, debate or discussion in the last few days about the origins of the coronavirus. As you know, uh, uh, Senator Tom Cotton has weighed in um, and, and there's been a lot of discussion around what he said. Why don't you give us your take? Yeah, we don't know the origins of the coronavirus. And we're not going to know for quite some time, Jan, because the Beijing government is preventing everyone from finding out. So, for instance, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, they're not allowed into China. Also, the World Health Organization, they do have a team there now, but they're going to peripheral areas in China. They're not going to any place in Hubei province, the center of the outbreak. They're not going to Wuhan, the epicenter. And so, you know, anything right now, I think, is open. You know, when Senator Cotton says, you know, we don't know, that's absolutely right. And that means when you don't know, you can't rule out. I mean, you can't rule out, for instance, that this was a release from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, that P4 biosafety lab. So, you know, right now, um, I think the Senator Cotton is absolutely right about this. So, you know, in general, um, there's also been a lot of uh, discussion about uh, the response of the Chinese Communist government, Chinese Communist regime to all of this, um, and especially around, uh, you know, the, the priorities it has. And I know you've had a lot to say about that. Give us an outline, please. Well, it, this is the time frame is really very damning. We know that the first patient was diagnosed somewhere around December 8, maybe earlier. Uh, there have been a few indications in the last couple of days it might be earlier than that December 8th date. The first public announcement from Beijing was December 31st. It was low key. Um, there was a Politburo standing committee meeting on January 7th, and the coronavirus was discussed. That was not disclosed. It was only until you get to about January 2021st that Beijing all of a sudden starts imposing these draconian measures. So in that period, when you have, for instance, after the end of the first week of December to about the third week of January, the Communist Party was suppressing information about the virus. And that means people were doing all sorts of things that helped spread the virus. So for instance, on the 19th of January, the Wuhan city held a potluck lunch or dinner for 40,000 families. If you're thinking about designing an event that could spread a disease, that's exactly what you would be doing. So this is really the issue here about the Communist Party. Um, you know, it's, it's not a matter of what they're doing now. What they're doing now is important, but really it was what they didn't do. They didn't tell the Chinese people. Xi Jinping knew about it on January 7th. So of course, this has become a run-of-the-mill virus, has now become an epidemic, which could very well soon become a pandemic. Um, why do you think they didn't say anything? This is Communist Party secrecy. Um, and so we can go back to your first question about Tom Cotton talking about uh, the, the, the Institute of Virology. You know, there is, uh, um, you know, a lot of people are saying it came from there. Now, we don't know that, of course, but we do know that The Lancet, which is the authoritative British journal, said many of the initial cases have nothing to do with that seafood market that everyone points the finger at. Well, if this didn't come from the seafood market, it might have come from that P4 lab, which is only 20 miles away. That disclosure that this actually was released from a lab would rock the Communist Party. I don't see how that they would survive that. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean, though, it's a bioweapon or something no. like that. And you, that, you have yeah. this idiot Rutgers professor who is saying in response to Cotton, oh, I see no evidence that this was engineered. Well, that stuff in the lab, not all of it is engineered. Some of it is, you know, they've been collecting samples of coronavirus. Um, you know, you have that uh, couple in Canada who were um, uh, caught. 
They were sending coronavirus samples to that Wuhan lab. So it doesn't mean that everything there was engineered, but it does mean it could have come from that lab. So what is what do you see as the impact of all of this? I mean, you've been talking recently about the kind of economic impact both on China, but of course that's very tightly related to the U.S. and the world. Too. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's so many things going on. Um, you know, if you start from the official statements, uh, you have all sorts of state economists are saying, oh, China's growth this quarter will be no less than 5%. Well, well, that's absurd, um, because first of all, China was growing nowhere near 5% during this, uh, before the um, uh, announcement of the outbreak. You know, a lot of people were thinking China last year, 2019, growing somewhere like the U.S., in the twosies. But regardless of what was happening, right now, Jan, we know that oil demand in China is down 20% year on year. That's a f big indication that China is in the red. I don't see how it could be growing at all. Some people saying negative 6%, who knows? But that's, I think, pretty close to where it is. You know, you have all of these big events being canceled. You know, foreigners supposed to have come in for China for conferences, those have been canceled. The Canton Fair, which is the premier trade show, that's scheduled for, that was scheduled for April, that's been canceled. So when you put all this together, people are locked in their homes, they're not consuming, businesses haven't restarted. Some of them have restarted with only about 26, 27% of their workers, which is the average. You add that all together and you gotta say that China right now is contracting. That, you know, a lot of countries have economies that contract. China hasn't admitted to a year-on-year -year contraction since 1976, the year that Mao Zedong died. Um, and also, you know, now you've got a Communist Party. One of the primary bases of legitimacy is the continual delivery of prosperity. Here you have no prosperity. Um, so this is a regime-shaking event. So, you know, we know that, for example, Apple stock has taken a hit. And I think, I, I recall that Peter Navarro even was saying, well, uh, Apple is uniquely exposed or more exposed than, than others. Um, well, it's uniquely exposed because it's got so much of its manufacturing in China. Also, it has a management team that is, I think, oblivious. Just, just think of this, Sean. Last month, January, uh, Apple issued its revenue forecast for this current quarter. Um, then, um, you know, you have the Monday of this week, you have China, you have Apple saying, oh, we're going to miss our, our revenue targets. We're not going to have products available. Well, couldn't they have seen that in January? I mean, people were around the world were talking about what was then called Wuhan pneumonia. Um, if Apple didn't see it, then, you know, its management team is incompetent. I mean, because everybody or a lot of other people saw it. So, um, you know, yes, Apple is uniquely centered on China. Um, and unfortunately, it has uh, people who just don't understand what's going on in the country where they're supposed to have all their center of interest. Well, you know, when we were speaking offline a little earlier, you also mentioned that Somehow Wall Street is oblivious to, these, to this reality. I think Wall Street in general uh, understands coronavirus, understands it can have an effect. So, you know, you go back two Fridays or so, you know, coronavirus knocks 600 points off the Dow, at least uh, interday. Um, and there have been a couple of other sessions where people have identified coronavirus as, as being a factor. But, you know, all in all, um, I don't think that they understand the significance of this because I think they're still buying into the notion that China will grow 5%. Um, Xi Jinping on February 3 just came out and said, look, we're going to meet our growth targets for the year, which is just absolutely stunning. Um, and, um, you know, people on Wall Street buy this stuff because that's what they want to hear. But, you know, it's not just a question of what's going to happen to China. Second largest economy in the world, you know, is essentially moribund right now. Um, Wall Street doesn't get that. Um, but the problem, of course, is that uh, so many companies manufacture in China, and that is going to have effect. And it's not just on Apple. It's on other companies as well. So anything that is made in China or anything that is made from components that are made in China could very well start disappearing from store shelves or wherever, um, largely because, you know, you have um, container ships are either avoiding Chinese ports where they're loading up only at 10% of their normal load. Um, and that's a real indication we're not going to have stuff from China. Um, so I, I think that this is quite serious. One other point on this, and that is Xi Jinping has is, is decided China should go back to work. That was this February right. 3 speech. 
So, um, you know, what they're doing is they're forcing the country back into um, work mode. But the virus uh, is not a sub, it hasn't gone away yet. So what they can do is they can ramp up things and make it look pretty good for a little while. But the problem here, Jan, is that by putting workers back to work prematurely, they're spreading the virus. The epidemic will come back in force. You know, it's just... Uh, sorry, one other point um, sure. that illustrates this, and that is that uh, you go back two or three days, Global Times, controlled by the Communist Party, runs a story saying it's time is ripe for workers to go back to work. Within hours, it issues a story with a headline, time is not ripe for the two sessions in Beijing, which were scheduled for the first week of March, the National People's Congress and the consultative body. Premier events in the life of the party, not going to happen. So, you know, we can see what's going on here. So, you know, you're kind of getting into the internal workings in China a little bit. Um, and so there's on one side, you've kind of described the secrecy, culture of secrecy. Um, and so what, what is your take on what's actually happening internally? Um, it is worse than the numbers suggest. So, for instance, today, China is admitting to 2004 deaths. Um, and that's got to be many, many multiples of that. They're admitting to 74,200 or so infections, many, many times multiple of that as well. Um, and, and, you know, we're starting to see this just from what the party is doing. Now, we don't know um, the dimension of this, obviously much worse, but um, we really don't know because all of our information or much of it comes from Beijing. Because, you know, Xi Jinping, he's trying to control the narrative. He's, he's putting more emphasis into that than into ending the disease. And by the way, those two goals are undermine each other. You can control the narrative, but to do that, you end up doing things which spread the disease. Or if you end the disease, you can't control the narrative. Xi Jinping has decided to control the narrative. So that makes it difficult for us to know with precision the number of infections, number of deaths, all sorts of things. But we can see what the party is doing. And when from we that, that's inconsistent with this idea that the disease is subsiding. Well, and it's, you know, I, I think you were mentioning the WHO a bit earlier, and it's you know, bizarre that, you know, they, WHO is obviously like highly cooperative with the Chinese that's Communist Party. That's a very, party. very diplomatic uh, way okay. of putting it. Um, well, they, they, they haven't been allowed into the epicenter, ostensibly the epicenter, right? As far as I understand yeah, it, they right? right? They're, they, they're going to Guangdong, they went to Beijing, you know, they're just going to, yeah, they might as well be going to Iceland for all of this. It's just, this is just ridiculous. And the World Health Organization sees it's more important to support communism in China than it is to end this disease. And this was evident, you know, you go back two weeks when they refused on two occasions to declare this to be a global health emergency. And finally, they get around to doing it after what, this starts to spread outside. Um, so, and then, and then you have the director general of WHO saying that China's response shows the superiority of communism. I think the world would be better without the WHO. They can take some of the staff functions and give them to someplace else. But the WHO on balance has been undermining the world's response to the coronavirus. It is then, I think, being a malign factor because it's not doing what it's supposed to do and it's allowing a lot, it's basically encouraging China to do irresponsible things. And so that's really wrong. I think the WHO director general should resign. I think the organization should just disband send the staff functions, the technical stuff to other places. But really, this is creating a very bad situation, not just for the Chinese people, but for people outside. You know, I was I tried to put my head you know, myself into the head of someone that might be, you know, running the WHO. Presumably they you don't want to the go access. there. You, don't, okay. you do not want to go there. <laughs> but you know, how do you in the, with a regime like this that that you know, basically, you know, fu let's say functions the way it does that we know. Um, and but you need, presumably you want to you need to have access if you're going to be the WHO, you know, you, uh, how could you function without access to one point three, four billion people? Right. I mean, I'm not I, I'm not sure. I'm not necessarily they, they, taking the side, but but how, how and how are they? You said that they're behaving irresponsibly, getting encouraging Beijing, Beijing, Beijing. to behave irresponsibly. How is that? Yeah. Well, just to go to your other point. Yeah. They don't have access to this. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're in country, finally. You know, 
well after the, the outbreak was known and, and they're cooling their heels in places which are not important for the investigation of the virus. Right. So they might as well not be there. They don't have access. And, you know, and I can understand what you're saying that, you know, if you're the director general of the WHO or if you're the president of the United States, you can't go and maybe criticize Xi Jinping. Cause that's what the way people think. Um, because you need to get their cooperation. But the problem is, with the statements that we have heard from the WHO, from the White House, um, I think that they mislead people in the world into thinking that China is actually handling this when it's not. And Xi Jinping hears this and he says, oh, everyone's afraid of me, I can do what I want, no matter how irresponsible or dangerous it is. Um, so that's why I think that um, the WHO on balance has been a negative factor. It has helped China take positions that ultimately end up in spreading the virus. And we see it now. There are a thousand infections outside of China. I'm not saying that there would have been no infections uh, if the WHO had been moving faster, had been more responsible, but maybe they wouldn't have been so many because you got to remember that a lot of people left China um, while the WHO was dithering on the sidelines right. and getting countries not to move as fast as they could have. So this is a political problem. It's a Beijing political problem, and it's a problem in multilateral organizations. You know, to your point, from what I understand, while this wasn't disclosed, 7 million people actually, before there was a lockdown on Wuhan, 7 million they people left. went traveling. So, it, you know, it's hard to imagine how the infection wouldn't spread with 7 million people traveling you know, to, to your point. Um, so do you think that, let's say this isn't working for the CCP very well right now, right? And I think, I th I think that the evidence shows that. Right. Um, do you think they can change to become effective? No, communists are communists. Um, that's an unfashionable view. But you remember, you look at their response to SARS and you look at the response now, it's not materially different. If it's different at all, it's because China now has social media, which has forced the Communist Party into maybe being a little bit more open. Remember, they were open for four or five days in, in uh, like the fourth week, third week of January. Right. Um, so the party has not changed. It is trying to control the narrative. It is placing that much higher emphasis than it is on um, ending the disease. Um, we're seeing Xi Jinping especially the last couple of weeks, spend much more effort on um, suppressing information. They've gone back to that. They're now trying to get people back to work prematurely. So no, the, the party hasn't changed. Um, and that's really unfortunate, which means after four decades of, for instance, American engagement and five decades or so of engagement from Europe, this is, party has just been basically the same. Maybe a little bit worse. Remember, even before this virus, Xi Jinping was pushing China back from authoritarianism to a form of totalitarianism with his social credit system, all the surveillance cameras, all of the other things. So really what you have is China moving in the wrong directions. And, and Jan, by the way, China might even be moving faster to totalitarianism because of the coronavirus. Because of course, you know, when any any government is going to in, impose some severe measures to end an epidemic. These just might not end after the epidemic eventually passes. Because Xi Jinping is trying to use this to control. He realizes he's vulnerable. All sorts of things are going on in Beijing, which probably very few of them are good trends. Well, yeah, no, I mean, we've seen all these reports and, you know, videos of people being like welded into their homes, of bu oh. buildings being closed. The, what of, about the nurses being forced into Wuhan? That was really heart rendering. Absolutely. So given everything that, you know, we, you've seen up to now, where do you expect the trajectory will go within China? Because we don't know about the coronavirus, we don't know how long it'll last. Most people assume that you get to about June, July, this thing just heats up and, and disappears. Um, but we don't know. We know that this coronavirus is very different. Um, you know, SARS had a, you know, every SARS infected person infected maybe two others or something like this. This one is in the fives or sixes, some people, some virologists say. So um, this is a very different type of virus. We haven't seen anything like this before. And when, you know, virologists call this a novel, they're not kidding. So 
I sort of let's let's assume that it's it's like every other virus disappears in the summertime. I think the Chinese economy is not flat for two quarters, especially the first quarter. Um, and as I said, Xi Jinping forcing people back to work, he can sort of revive the economy, but he does it at a bigger cost in the second quarter, third quarter. Um, this thing reverberates into the U.S. end of second quarter, especially the third quarter, as we're not getting products from China. Remember, you know, 80 percent or even more of our antibiotics come from China. So we're going to see some really severe shortages in this country that are going to affect people in direct and tangible ways. Um, you can't rule anything out because this is such a regime shaking event. You know, after the February 7th death of the Wuhan whistleblower, Dr. Li Wenliang, yes. um, you know, you had people in China, they weren't just angry, they were, let's get of this, rid of this regime angry. People were talking about what the hashtag in China was, I want freedom of speech. You know, they started singing, uh, Do You Hear the People Sing, that politically impactful song from Les Miserables. Um, this has sort of gotten people to think that the form of their government has contributed or even caused their misery. Um, and you got to remember, go back to what Tom Cotton said. People in China are saying, this is, this is crazy stuff, but people in China are saying that uh, the opponents of Xi Jinping do, at the lab deliberately released an engineered virus to get rid of Xi Jinping. Now, that's crazy stuff. But it doesn't matter whether it's crazy or not. What matters is that some people in China actually believe that, and that has political consequences. So you start looking at this. This is why this lab issue is so important, because it's not just a question of where did this thing come from. It's a question of what happens to the political system, because people do actually believe theories of various degrees of craziness about this coronavirus. And that means Beijing is going to have a very difficult time maintaining legitimacy. Remember, once people stop, um, you know, once this thing recedes, um, whether that's June, July or, you know, five years from now, the point is, well, it won't be five years, but whenever it recedes, people are going to stop worrying about um, their uh, life and they're going to start the recriminations. That's when the political system is going to be shaken. So I think that you're going to look at a June, July, August time frame where there's going to be a lot of discussion about where China goes. And Xi Jinping is not going to like a lot of this. Remember, you've got a number of pretty senior academics who are saying Xi Jinping is not that smart, quote unquote, and should resign. You know, the Tsinghua University law professor who said that two weeks ago, uh, Zhu Zhang Ren. Um, this is just, this is, this just shows people are no longer afraid. And when people are no longer afraid, when they feel the safety in numbers, anything yawn can happen. Because this was kind of the, the unspoken pact, right? Stability for a degree of, rep for repression. But this, if the stability is gone, then... The, uh, the prosperity is gone. Well, people say that, and I can sort of see the basis for that, but really it's like the Communist Party just forced people to um, not express themselves in the way that they felt. So it was not so much like a bargain, it was more or less like um, you have no choice. And you know, that's, of course, that's the way people, people aren't gonna stand up um, and say, this is how I feel in the middle of Tiananmen Square or whatever. Um, but when people feel, lose their fear, and, and people lose fear for a lot of reasons. We had that video of that woman in the room in Wuhan, 367,000 views yesterday, where she calls for the end of the Communist Party. Right. She calls for the independence of various parts of China, which is really just striking. But she is angry. And the reason, the reason why that's impactful is not that one woman is going to be able to bring down Xi Jinping, at least today or yesterday. Um, but it's very well at a point where a lot of people say, yeah, that's how I feel. I'm not putting up with it anymore, especially because the economy is falling apart and these communist idiots are mismanaging my China. So, you know, of course, the Chinese Communist Party is trying to, you know, clamp down on all this type of expression. But it just my, my take is that there's just so much of it now that it's just getting through. There's no way to completely. And, and yeah. even if it doesn't happen in June or July, this is Chernobyl, April 1986. Uh, you have the Chernobyl um, incident. The, um, and what's important is not that a reactor blew up in, 
in the Ukraine, um, what's important was the secrecy and the cover-up, and sort of within five years, the Soviet Union is gone. So it could take some time, but I think that, you know, we've had a number of these events recently, um, and coronavirus is only um, the one that's on our mind at this moment. Right. But what it says is that there's a consensus forming. People are still afraid, um, but um, at some point, I think that they won't. Remember, this is, look at the economy. This is an economy that's contracting. You know, Xi Jinping can say, oh, we're growing at 6%. People are, that, that just creates derision and ridicule. And once you start that, that adds to the sort of like, I don't want these people around anymore. You know, um, to the point of trying to maintain secrecy uh, at any cost, you know, just I think today or yesterday, um, the CCP basically expelled three Wall Street Journal journalists after, because ostensibly of an article kind of, I think it was titled the Asia, Sick Man, the sick of, man Asia, of Asia, basically. But of course, these journalists had nothing to do with that particular article. Now, the, I, there's an, a bit of an irony here to me, too, because I, I checked and the Wall Street Journal still carries this paid propaganda from the Chinese Communist Party, uh, uh, the China Watch, we call them, in, it, in its pages. But this is the first time since 98, from what I've read from the Foreign Correspondents right. Association. That um, someone's been actually expelled. That someone's been actually expelled. Typically, they just let their visas right. run out and they don't, don't renew them. But it, it, what do you make of this? This is... Uh, this is important for one reason. Expelling the three journalists makes no sense for Beijing. When governments do things that make no sense, you have to ask, what the devil is going on? And I think what you have is a political system at the top, which is lashing out and doing things that are only going to hurt it. China needs the cooperation of the world right now. So what is it doing? It's making it difficult for the United States to cooperate with China. So, um, I worry that Xi Jinping can lash out. Remember, this is a guy who has changed the Chinese political system, moving it from a consensual system to essentially a one-man dictatorship. Sorry, Mike Bloomberg, but yeah, it's very close to a one-man dictatorship right now. And by doing that, he's done a couple of things. Um, one of them is he's gotten rid of the rules, the norms, the institutions, the guidelines that guided the party, that sort of, you know, sort of kept things on an even keel. And by doing that, Xi Jinping got rid of those because they inhibited his accumulation of power. But by doing that, he's also gotten rid of the safety net. Those rules, if they were still in place, would have protected him. So, you know, Xi Jinping, you know, people say, oh, Donald Trump, uh, he's got an election every four years. So. That's not a that's that's a good system because Xi Jinping right now has an election every day. He's got an election every hour because if, if people decide to get rid of him, he's gone because there is no institutional safety net for him anymore. And by the way, as people point out, you accumulate great power, you accumulate great accountability. You have a more and more difficult time saying, oh, you know, it was these foreigners or it was somebody else causing these problems. You know, so I, I think that what you essentially got right now is a desperate strongman at the center of the Chinese political system right now who is flailing about, who worried about being alive tomorrow, and he can do anything. Because if he's dead, it doesn't matter that he kills a lot of other people, including Americans. Because if you're dead anyway, you might as well roll the dice because that way you have a chance of actually surviving. So, and you know, and these other kind of power structures, you know, within like the Politburo and so forth, and probably aren't very happy with them at the moment. Well, they can't be um, because, you know, this, this whole um, conversation across the social media platforms in China about how, you know, we need a more open political system that undermines the livelihoods and the futures of all these Communist Party leaders. So. You know, it's just sort of like it's been one debacle after another. You know, if, you're, if you've got great power and you have China in 2017 or 2018, whatever, and things are going China's way, that's really great if you're Xi Jinping. But you hit 2019 before the coronavirus um, epidemic hits and things are going badly for China across the board and then you got this coronavirus mess. Um, it really indicates that Xi Jinping right now 
he's he's got to be in trouble. Now, he is trying to accumulate more power because he thinks uh, apparently by doing that, he can prevent dissent within Communist Party ranks. Maybe he can do it, I don't know. But it's probably unlikely because eventually people are going to say, as they did to Mao Zedong when his policies created debacles, that you know they gotta strip him of some power, they gotta put him in the background, they gotta kill him, who knows? Um, so this is, this is a situation where we have to continue and place actually more emphasis on deterring Xi Jinping from doing bad things. So these statements that, you know, from various capitals, from the WHO, oh, you're doing a great job, comrade, you know, that needs to end because we need to start sending messages in private and in public that we are gonna deter China from um, dangerous, aggressive, hostile behavior, which I think is now going from the point of being not very likely to we better worry about this. So, you know, it, it's interesting that you say that because, I mean, of course, 2019 and maybe even a few years before that, sort of the, the way that a lot of people have handled China, especially the U.S. government, has, has changed quite a bit. You know, I'm thinking as we are seeing these journalists expelled for the the first time in eight years from China, we're also seeing the five major CCP propaganda organs. They call themselves news organizations like the China Daily and Xinhua, the Xinhua News Agency, you know, officially the propaganda arm of the Communist Party, being called out as the propaganda arm of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, that, you know, wouldn't have happened a year ago or I mean I just I, I, I I've never seen anything like that in the many years I've been kind of watching I don't know what you're yeah take, take a look at let's let's just go back to December of last year um, you know the thing that we were talking about Hong Kong um, which has now been um, sort of knocked off the front pages you know a lot of people were saying to President Trump oh you can't sign those two Hong Kong bills that cleared Congress because if you do that you'll anger China and you anger China, they won't give you a trade deal. That was, that was what all the smart people in the U.S. were saying. Well, you know, the problem was that the Chinese heard that too, and they were saying, oh, this is good, you know. All, all we have to do is say, you know, to propagate this line further, and, um, ch you, know, you know, Trump's not going to do anything bad to us. Well, Trump said no. He signed the two bills in December, and what happened? Well, the Chinese signed the trade deal anyway on January 15th. So, you know, you've got um, a sort of a new attitude in Washington that is more like, well, we can take these guys on because they're not so great. And by the way, um, there's an anger in this country about that January 15th signing in the East Room of the White House. The Chinese knew about the coronavirus epidemic, and yet they sent this big trade delegation, put them in the same room with the, you know, a good portion of the U.S. leadership, putting them in the possible infection. And by the way, um, this was not just the U.S. The Chinese sent this delegation to Davos so um, at about the same time. The Chinese knew about the outbreak. And yet they did this, it was grossly irresponsible. They exposed all sorts of people to the coronavirus. And it's now starting, people in the U.S. are starting to say, hey, this was really bad. Um, so I think you're going to see a much different posture towards Beijing. You know, it's sort of like, we're going to no longer say, oh, we can't afford to irritate the Chinese. We can't sign these Hong Kong bills. We got to do everything possible to make them happy. Uh-uh. People are starting to see that way of thinking is absolutely 100 percent wrong. You know, it, and to your point, you know, I've been kind of I was watching the Munich Security Conference, you know, and some of our re reporting around there. And it's really um, it's been unusual. I, I, you, I know you have something to say, so I'm going to get you to talk to you a moment. I'll restrain myself. But, uh, <laughs> no, but there are actually some very significant things. For example, I, I understand that Nathan Law spoke, who's you know the founder right. of the opposition party, one of the big opposition parties in Hong Kong. I don't think that ever ha anything like that ever happened before. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg was there speaking and said some some very harsh words about freedom of speech vis-a-vis -vis China and how we. That's don't after want sucking up to Xi Jinping. Yeah. Right. Well, well, I mean, I mean, to, a, to, a year ago. To, to his credit, it's a it's, it's a big changed. change it's of, changed, of population. Yeah. I mean, 180, as far as I can tell. Um, and then, of course, you know, Mike Pompeo speaking, and it, it's it's a it's a different different. Well, but 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 tell me what you were thinking too, please. Yeah. 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just can't wait. Um, it, it, you see the 2017 National Security Strategy, mm -hmm. which ditches the words of China being a partner and a friend and starts talking about uh, it as a rival, uh, a revisionist power. And it does that in connection with, its, with Russia as well. And then, which is really striking, um, in October of last year, you have both Secretary of State Pompeo and Vice President Mike Pence give speeches on China, which are very different in tone than you've ever heard from a U.S. official. At least you have to go back to the Eisenhower administration and to Dulles to hear things that are similar. And what Pompeo said during his speech, which was the Hudson Institute, he said, Look, I'm going to give a series of speeches that are going to define American policy toward China. And you have to start to think, this is sort of like our version of the 1946 Long Telegram and the 1947 X article, both um, from George Kennan, the State Department, um, that really changed the paradigm of our thinking about the Soviet Union. So what Pompeo and Pence I have been really doing is just changing the way um, Americans think about China. And one other thing, um, Arthur Waldron, who you know, you've, you've interviewed him, says that the Chinese need to start thinking about today as like the battle of the wilderness in 1864 during the American Civil War. That was an indecisive event near Fredericksburg, Virginia. And the Confederate generals all expected Ulysses S. Grant, who was just the newly named commander of the Union Army. They had expected uh, Grant to turn north, um, back to the safety of okay. Washington, D.C. And the reason why they expected him to do that was every other Union general did that after an engagement with the Confederates. What Grant did was, instead of turning north, to the cheers of Union soldiers, he turned south, began a series of ferocious engagements that within a year led to the defeat of the Confederacy. That was what's known as Grant's turn south. That's a change in thinking. And what Waldron says is that if the Chinese want to know American mentality at this time, they should study the American Civil War, Grant's turn south in 1864 after Fredericksburg. That explains what's going on in America right now. Uh, that's absolutely a fascinating perspective. We'll have to we'll have to talk to Arthur <laughs> more about that. What a mind! Um, yeah, we just all of us just convey the brilliance of Arthur Walsh. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gordon, um, I, the thing that actually jumps to my mind right now is that one of the uh, uh, things that America is kind of discovering, or maybe you know, seemingly this year is the level of influence that the Chinese Communist Party has had here in the U.S. And of course, this is, you know, these, this new uh, guideline from the State Department about these five media being called what they are, propaganda organs, and actually designated as missions, uh, you know, uh, of, the, of the Chinese Communist Party or the, of China. Um, speaks to that, but you know we're we're learning about Yale and Harvard, for example, having hundreds of millions of undisclosed funding. The Department um, of Education, yes, um, over a course of like two years, for a period of two years, found six point five billion dollars of payments from China that were not disclosed by American educational institutions, including the aforesaid Harvard and Yale, but also including a lot of others. That that's. Those are astounding numbers. Yeah, I mean, it's not just China. I mean, there's Saudi Arabia and Qatar in there, but it, it shows the influence of China. Um, you know, you got the Confucius Institutes, you have all sorts of funding. Yeah, I mean, you have the Harvard professor, the chairman of the chemistry department, right. Charles Lieber, now being prosecuted for um, lying about his contacts with China. So. Yeah, well, I mean, the FBI says there's a thousand, more than a thousand open investigations of Chinese intellectual property theft. So, how big, in your view, you know, from your vantage point today, is that level of influence today with this turn south that you describe? Yeah, um, I mean, China still has its Charles Liebers all over the place. Um, it's got a lot of spies. Um, so, and it's got Henry Kissinger. Um, is his name Lucifer? Yeah, yeah, Lucifer. Um, Henry Lucifer Kissinger. Um, 
But I think they don't have the influence um, that these guys once had. And the reason is that, first of all, you got a very willful president. Um, and uh, although he says some China-friendly things from now and, and then, which distress the hell out of me and others, um, you know, it's nonetheless, you have someone who is just not going to listen to the smart people in New York and Washington. So I think that that's really important. And so um, China, I think, is on the way out, at least now. Um, so, um, I mean, it, it could change. I mean, it could have a Biden or a, a Bloomberg who say, who have really very pro-China views. Um, but nonetheless, I don't think either of them is going to be president of the United States. Um, and we're, we're at a point where even across the American political spectrum, there is this real concern about China. Remember, it's not just Trump. It's also uh, the establishment wing of the Democratic Party. So it's House Speaker Pelosi. It's Minority Leader um, Schumer. These people are, are actually tougher on China than Trump. Now, you get, of course, you got a lot of Democratic Party candidates who are just want to criticize Trump, and so they take Beijing's positions. But I think that even if one of them does become president, we're going to see that they're going to be pushed by the American people in ways that um, are going to be more realistic about China. We're going to have a much more, uh, we're going to have a frank conversation about it. And a lot of the things that China has done over the course of decades, including stealing hundreds of billions of dollars of U.S. intellectual property a year, just will no longer be tolerated. Well, you know, there, there have been these voices all along, you know, like yourself, actually House Speaker Pelosi, to her credit. You know, I remember 20 years ago against most favored nation status, vociferously against, you know, uh, there She's were an these, inspiration yeah. to, to many, many people, including me. Yeah. Um, there is this there is this cons bipartisan consensus, it seems for sure. At the same time, you know, we're seeing a lot of pushback, right? There was this, for example, open letter from however many uh, intellectuals, I can't remember a few, so, some, yeah. some months back, which I was stunned by, frankly. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, of course, on, on the Section 301 tariffs. Yes. Um, and this, so this is, this is the ultimate question. So you think, it's, you think that the voices of reason around China are going to prevail here, the way things are going? Yeah, I, I believe so. And, you know, and it's not like we Americans are smart. So I'm, 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 we're not. Um, but China will push um, the U.S. It'll push other countries in, in directions where they don't think they want to go. And I think that that delegitimizes um, a lot of the pro-China pro voices so I, I don't, I, I, I think it's not because, I, I do think of, at least ordinary common Americans have common sense. Um, that's not true in, in certain urban centers on the East Coast. But nonetheless, I think we're, we're moving in a better direction because Beijing, under a very hostile, belligerent Xi Jinping, will push us there. So um, any final words before we finish up? Oh my gosh. <laughs> You know, this is, this is just, your chance. <laughs> yeah. My sense is that um, if you go back, even just three, four months ago, you had this notion that, uh, oh, you know, China's going to dominate the world. Um, you know, you had a lot of people in Washington and Bay in, in New York saying, oh, we just got to manage American decline. You know, this sort of Bill Clinton line. Um, that's gone. I think people see the fundamental weakness of the Chinese political system because they've completely mishandled this coronavirus episode. And, and so this has taken a hit. And what we're seeing right now is because of supply chain disruptions, you're seeing more and more factories move to other countries. Uh, so there's going to be this emphasis on proximity manufacturing. All of these trends are going to undermine the ability of Xi Jinping and the Communist Party to maintain itself. And we are going to see, if maybe not the sick man of Asia, um, the Wall Street Journal, thank you, but we are going to see a new appreciation of China. We're going to see it in a much more realistic light, which means we're going to see it as a fundamentally weak state, a state that has passed its peak, and we're going to see the strength of uh, democracies around the world. So I, I think that ultimately things are going to move in the right direction. And as I mentioned before, even if they... Even if we don't want to move in that direction, and you know, and a lot of people in this country don't, China will push us there. 
Gordon Chang, such a pleasure to have you again. Oh, thank you so much, John.